Continue. There they come. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pickling Cucumbers and Vegetables with our friend Hal. Um, I am Gator. We're here to get you through this morning. Wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation about pickling and here on the Enviro House webinars series. Um, there's a lot of people coming in today, so I hope you have your cup of coffee or your cold beverage and you're ready to get going. I am going to start by introducing uh, how this all works. So for those of you coming in now um, and those who are gonna be joining us shortly, this is being recorded and it will be made available shortly on the uh, Tacoma Enviro House webpage, which is cityoftacoma.org slash uh, workshops and you can check those out uh, past and present uh, webinars and what's coming up in the future. Uh, also if you want to communicate with us you can go through the chat feature and I'm going to type in our web address for these workshops. This is also where you can register. In the chat feature you can type in all panelists and attendees is a little drop down menu for the two who you're going to say, oh, send it to and here's that website. I just sent it to everybody. And I will welcome everybody with a good morning. So go ahead and put your comments in there. And the way we want you to communicate with us if you have a question about this during this webinar is through the Q&A. You can enter your questions in the Q&A. We are slated to have a large group this morning. So please be patient. There's only two of us working here behind the scenes. And we want to make sure we get all your questions asked, uh, answered and asked on air. So um, bear with us if we don't get to them all right away. We will try to eventually get to them. Also, we'll make sure they're timely. So if he's, if I know Hal's going to bring up something in a few moments, I'll wait till that happens and then we'll bring that question to him. So do be patient. Um, the other way you can communicate, I said, is in the chat. So Q&A and chat. We'll also have polls. We're going to ask you some questions during this webinar that are going to just kind of get you to get engaged and maybe, you know, understand what, what's going on in the pickling world. And right now I'm going to show you one like, how did you hear about this EnviroHouse workshop? So I'm going to send out a poll right here. And I'm going to give everyone about, you know, about 30 seconds to answer here. So answer, answer quickly. And it's, how did you hear about this webinar? Through Facebook, Enviro News, email, Enviro House Workshop website, a friend, colleague, or family member, a workplace email, or other. And if you have an other, like, that's interesting, you can put it in the chat where we are interested and in find out where it is you might have heard about it. Um, again, if you are in the poll, uh, I mean, in the chat feature, change your two to all panelists and attendees. That way, everyone who's in this can, can see it. Okay, I'm gonna give you about 10 more seconds to answer, about 80% have answered. So let's see if we can get some of those up. Go ahead. And I'm gonna end the polling in five. Five, four, three, four. And While let's... you're doing that, Gator, I'm going to put the uh, contact information for me in the Enviro House in the chat. Absolutely. As you can see that 91% of our viewers this morning got it through Facebook. Gosh, social media. Um, we got. It looks like we got to work a little bit in our uh, Enviro House workshop web website, and that's something you guys can do is go to that website and check things out. And if you um, enjoy this or the other workshops, uh, promote it to your friends, colleagues, and all of that. Absolutely, tell someone okay. about it. Thank you, Hal. So, before we give it to Hal to go uh, on with his pickling, and because I'm curious, I like a good pickle. Janda, why don't you go tell us what's coming up this next couple of weeks uh, through the Enviro House webinars, and are we coming back to the Enviro House anytime soon? Maybe you know an answer. <laughs> Don't we wish. Um, I was actually there yesterday watering plants and doing a little bit of cleanup and fixing some exhibit things, but we have not been told yet when we will be able to go back. Um, we're going back by departments. Um, I am guessing that I may be back in sometime later in August, I would think for sure by September. Um, I do not know yet what the visitor rules will be. I think probably workshops on site may be limited just because the space is so tight, but hopefully we'll be able to get started doing something. We will continue the webinars regardless because this has been really um, helpful to people that cannot get there. Um, so I think we'll see a combination of both opportunities. August is typically vacation month for everybody. Um, so we will not be doing anything in August. Um, 
we will be coming back after Labor Day and doing Saturdays and weekday afternoons, depending on the presenter's availability and preference. Um, hopefully we'll be able to have Hal back again sometime in late September or maybe October during um, season when things are being harvested and things are done with them. It depends on his availability. Um, we will do one on putting your garden to bed. We'll do another one on heat pumps for the winter, um, pruning fruit trees and pruning landscape trees. Um, and uh, I'm still working on getting those lined up. So if you have things that you want to do and um, learn about and we haven't offered them and it fits in with the scope of what we're trying to do, please let me know in that information. Um, link that we put in there and we'll see if we can find an instructor and fit it in. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I did ask everybody in the chat where you're from. We have some people from Puyallup and Graham and Auburn, someone all the way from Thailand and Palmer, Alaska and Whoa. Oxnard, California. So welcome one and all from far and wide, close and far. <laughs> um, now I think it's time. We're going to get right. To, we'll get to it now. I don't I can't say right to it. We're going to get to it now. Um, so thank you everyone for checking in where you're from. So exciting. Hal, please enlighten us to the world of pickling cucumbers and vegetables. <laughs> we'll see you in a few with questions and whatnot. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining. I'm just kind of watching the numbers go up as folks are coming in. My bad, I hit the wrong button. Mal, uh, Hal, you have to unmute. There we go. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Well, anyway, I was just welcoming everybody and thanking you for attending. I think that in really about the best thing, the only good thing that has come out of the whole pandemic is the way that so many different venues have been able to step up and introduce programs like this, uh, where information can continue. It's convenient. People have a record of it. Uh, so I really want to thank the Enviro House and Tacoma Sustainability and everyone who's involved with this. Uh, we're anxiously awaiting the opportunity to start in-person events because a, a good portion of what we do have been in-person workshops, either producing things for food banks or working with uh, folks to teach them different skills. And so our program is the uh, Center for Food Preservation Arts. And uh, one of our, I guess, taglines is growing together through the community of food. So you can see here we have a group of volunteers making applesauce to distribute to a food bank. We have a class uh, here in process. Uh, we have, uh, I, I just love her. She is like in her 90s and has been volunteering with us for a long time. And we were able to adapt and continue to do some work, especially for the food banks, uh, all during the pandemic. We only had to be down until the 1st of April when they were figuring out what kind of uh, safety we needed to take. So we have those opportunities. We're looking forward to the in-person events. And at the end where we have contact information, if you um, sign up for our Facebook page, if you go and like it or, or friend it so that you'll get notices, uh, the Center for Food Preservation Arts Facebook page is one of the first places that we announce those. And then uh, most of them are either very low cost or no cost at all. So, and in, when we get to some other polling, and certainly in the chats, um, let us know if there's particular classes you'd like to see in the future. <clears throat> so let's jump right into talking about pickling. So sometimes I, I try to insert a little humor, but also some facts we might not think about. Like July, and I didn't plan it this way, it just worked out. July is National Pickle Month. But strangely enough, November 14th is National Pickle Day. So I guess they're covering both ends of the year. The first mention of pickles is in records that are over 4,000 years old. And for ages, obviously the best way to preserve things in the beginning was dehydrating. But then when they discovered that things could either, either ferment on their own 
or especially when they discovered that when wine went bad, it turned into vinegar and that could be used for pickling. Pickling had become something that is in every culture in some form. And there are thousands of unique flavors and many different techniques. And the products can be used either alone all the time or mixed into other foods. So later on in our contact page, we have a link to a an online resource list that has a huge number of resources, more recipes than we can possibly talk about today, uh, fun facts, including uh, videos done by a, 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 well, I guess you call them a, um, it, it's a kind of an interesting page. It's uh, on a YouTube channel and it's Natalie and Tara Try Stuff. And if you're interested in just a lot of fun, they have a playlist of pickle month from last year, including making Kool-Aid flavored pickles. Um, I've never tried those, I'm not sure I will, but there's lots of different ways to make pickles. But basically, how do we define them? What are pickles? Well, they're fresh fruits or vegetables that are in an acidic liquid. Because what's important is that the pH is under 4.7. Now, if you're familiar with pH, the lower the number, the more acidic it is. And so anything under 4.7 is considered a very uh, acidic environment and they're much less likely to spoil. It retards the reproduction of bacteria and possibly just kills it outright. It even works on a botulism uh, bacteria. And the acid that creates that uh, environment is either made through fermentation, which is Mm, the very way that things I'm sure started with pickling. Somebody just left something sitting out, it had enough um, maybe salt on it and enough other uh, chemicals to help the bacteria to be killed, but then the lactose ones began to grow. Then when it came in and they began to standardize the process of making vinegar, that became the go-to way. And water bath canning then can take those uh, pickles and fruits and vegetables that are in that environment and make it uh, shelf stable. So we're gonna talk about several different ways, but we'll get to that in a moment. So why pickle at home? Why pickle at all? Well, we go back to starting with how I became interested. I, in my life, had lived through uh, four, maybe you can call it five if you count the pandemic, major events that disrupted the food chain, including down in Guadalajara during when they had the avian flu scare. And that's the first time I ever saw the shores, um, uh, store shelves go empty in less than a couple of hours, because we really only have about 48 hours worth of food available in the just-in-time system we have. Also, we have some better control over some of the ingredients. So average Americans eat 152 pounds of sugar and 42 pounds of corn syrup a year. And that's just on the average. This is um, statistics from a couple of years ago. It may have gone up or down, but I'm sure it hasn't changed much. And while a lot of the techniques in pickles require the use of salt, you can also find recipes different places for low salt or no salt pickles. And then there's cost. This is an accurate figure right now, $7.21 for every jar of these um, pickled beans, where on this over here, there are six jars of exactly the same recipe that are going to be made. And that cost of $6 total includes the jars and lids. And one of the biggest reasons that I'm always interested in this is exactly this quote, we are trashing our land to grow food that nobody eats. 
And that's one of the missions of the Enviro House and the offices of sustainability in all cities and counties is to help to reduce all that waste that goes to landfills or just gets trashed in garbage. So there are um, four how, big, yes, how, sir. sorry to interrupt. We did have some poll questions. Um, and this one we might get to right now is, uh, what's your experience with pickling or fermenting? Is it okay if I put that question up here first? Oh yeah, just kind of reach out and, and knock me on the head if I just get <laughs> rambling, okay? Well, I, just, I, you know, I wanna give you space, but all right, why don't we ask this question real quick before we get to this, how to do it. Um, the question out there, everybody, is what is your experience with pickling or fermenting? And there's your choices. I haven't tried the process. Um, now, fermenting, I mean, that was, you were saying, like, the original. I think I've done a few of those projects growing up in my refrigerator in the back. And, but uh, <laughs> my experience with pickling is very limited. We made some last year. I grew some, we grew some uh, cucumbers specifically for pickling, and they were, they turned out nice. We, we bought a made mix that I could just dump in there. Curious to learn how to do my own, like from oh, scratch. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good way to start the made mixes, but it's also just pretty simple. You'll see. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna give everyone about five more seconds, um, and we'll take a look at these really quickly. Okay, four, three, two, and one. Let's take a look at these real quick. Looks like many have not tried, but are excited to learn. A few beginners and tried some successfully made pickles, but want to try other vegetables. I'm kind of in the, I've tried some pickling, but limited success, so. Excellent. All right, so thank you. All right, Hal, go ahead and carry on. All right, well, the first way, and I can uh, suggest that would be the way for most people to start is refrigerator pickles. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Then there's also what are called fresh pack or quick process, which uh, is one of the traditional ways that people may remember their mom or their grandmother or even friends working with vinegar and bottling. Then there's what technically is a technique, not a whole different method, but it's short brine technique. And that is very important if you make relishes uh, or things like that. And then the fermented pickles, as we mentioned. There we go. So this is a clip, uh, still photo taken out of one of the videos that we have on our YouTube channel. And here's the link here. You can uh, go to that and you can pretty much uh, see all the videos that we do. But anyway, going back to the uh, presentation already in progress, you can see what a simple recipe this is. In fact, the name of the recipe is, you name it, refrigerator pickles. Uh, you just basically take what you have on hand. A lot of times, uh, cucumbers are one of the basics. Uh, carrots, scallions or green onions or green beans, cauliflower. If you like it hot, you can use uh, red chilies, jalapenos, pepper flakes. You pack the jar, you bring a brine mixture to a boil, which would be vinegar and water, and then you cover, cool, and refrigerate. And so there's a little bit more to the recipe, but one of the um, great things about starting with refrigerator pickles, which are often called the gateway drug to pickling, is that there's a lot of pros involved in it, a lot of good things. Good way to start, it lends itself to small batches. You may just have a few green beans that have, uh, if you're growing your own garden, a few of those, you might have some cucumbers in the refrigerator, might have cauliflower, all those different things that you can use up the odds and ends. So it's very flexible ingredients. And then this is a, high, a very important point. With refrigerator pickles, the main method of preservation is the cold of the refrigerator. You're using the acidity to add more flavor, to be a vehicle to carry the spices, uh, their flavors into the pickles, but they're not a shelf stable product. So the refrigeration keeps it safe. 
So they're not shelf stable, which means keeping them in the refrigerator, they store for only up to about two months. And if you have a jar of the pickles and you sit it out and leave it out, anything approaching two hours, that's going to pretty much eliminate the time. You really shouldn't leave these out because they're still basically a raw food. They're not, um, they haven't been water bathed or cooked and it needs electricity for storage. So uh, as we'll come to later, you need a specific amount of vinegar in a lot of recipes. And the vinegar has to be a 5%, which you will see uh, you purchase it that way and you need to check for that. But the refrigerator pickles, because the refrigeration is what's keeping them really safe, you have freedom to experiment with vinegars that aren't 5%. And you can also alter the ratio of water to vinegar. So it's really flexible. But like with all the pickling recipes we're going to mention and all that are posted, these are tested recipes that have been run through a process by either like the Departments of Agriculture or the National Center for Home Food Preservation and have tested them. So you don't want to just pull any recipe off a website. And one way that you can tell if it's a good recipe is it will often, um, whoever has posted it will say, I got this from the ball canning book, or I got this from uh, the local uh, Department of Agriculture Extension. Then we come to fresh pack. As I've mentioned, always use tested recipe. Fresh pack pickles, or quick pack is another name that's used, goes the extra step of the water bath canning. So it creates a vacuum and seals, the, uh, seals it off from the air and keeps it safe. Vinegar brine is the base of the fresh pack. It has a lower salt content than fermenting brine. So marginally, if you're trying to watch salt, uh, you, a, a quick pack pickle is probably better than a fermented pickle. And you always want to use pickling salt because pickling salt doesn't have any iodine or um, other agents in it. And things like iodine will affect whether your pickles stay crisp. It can also affect the color. If you have some um, garlic in it, like either whole cloves or just pieces, and you use a salt that has a lot of iodine in it, uh, the um, you know, you can end up with the garlic turning greenish. Uh, once when I first started out pickling, uh, we were made, a friend and I made some onion and garlic jam and it turned a bright green, as bright green as like a lime green. Like, like a mint chutney almost. <laughs> almost. Well, and that's what we told people later. But sure. <laughs> uh, we called at that point, you could call the uh, extension service. They still had a hotline. And they pointed at, they asked us, well, did you use a cast iron uh, kettle? No. Did, what kind of salt did you use? Uh, Morton's brand. What kind of Morton's? And it was <laughs> with iodine. Um, I do want to point out that at the end of this, we have a list of uh, resources that we will post, including those recipes that Hal mentioned. So bear. When, you get, when we get to the end of this, I'll, I'll post a link to that recipe and resource list. So don't be afraid. We'll get you the right resources. Yeah, and if you can hang in there towards the end, I'll also show you that list, show you what's on it. Um, and as I was mentioning before, the ratio of vinegar to water in these pickles is really important. Unless a tested recipe gives you a different ratio, it should be 50 percent water, 50 percent vinegar, and always using that five percent. And, and uh, you'll find somewhere on all vinegars, it will say diluted with water to whatever. Some of them like what are called uh, dressing, salad dressing vinegars, things like that, and champagne vinegars are often as low as two percent. Those won't work well for preserving. Uh, spices, as long as they're dried spices, they can be added uh, to 
the recipes. Most recipes have them. I'd always go with whatever recipe suggests. Uh, these are good to store on the shelf for up to two years, sometimes even longer. Uh, they don't go bad and become dangerous, but they lose some of the flavor and nutritional value. Um, and Al, it does. We do have a, oh, sorry, we do have a question real quick here. Um, mm -hmm. is, is pickling salt different from sea salt? I, I also yes. need that question. Yes, yes because sea salt, you don't know. They, all, they don't really do a full analysis of what all the ingredients are. And coming from the sea, it probably has a lot of iodine salts in it. So sea salt is wonderful for other kinds of cooking and things like pink salt and Himalaya salt, but you don't really know what the mineral content is. If it's high, I think pink salt is actually high in iron. So you might end up with um, it discoloring things. It might also end up with it making the pickles, um, whether they're carrots or peens or cucumbers, pretty limp, not as crisp as you like. And then just the last point was, you don't need any additional electricity for storing fresh pack. And these are just some of the examples of fresh pack and the variety of things you can put in it following a recipe. <clears throat> so this is uh, shelf stable canned carrots. And you can see that we have a bay leaf that came off of my uh, culinary bay tree. And you have a lot of spices in the bottom. You have garlic. Then over here, we have asparagus uh, that has been canned, shelf stable. Uh, put a lot of pepper flakes in it because it's a, a spicy asparagus recipe. Uh, slices of dill with the garlic, with the dill, fresh dill. These uh, spears, basically the same recipe but in uh, spears instead of slices. And then this one is really in interesting. This is white radish. You can pickle radish and it makes, uh, it's really good on a relish plate, but it's also really good to grate up uh, um, and use in recipes. So do we have any more questions? Uh, Yeah, we do have one question about seasoning. So you can choose to answer this now. Uh, is cumin seed one of your favorite spices? Like, so if you're talking recipes here, is cumin something you might uh, use a lot? Uh, you know, kind of the standard recipes in traditional European influenced is, doesn't use cumin as much. But anything that has a slightly um, painting with a broad stroke Eastern influence uses cumin and it uses other things like uh, sumac and different other spices like that. But when you get off into some of those more exotic spices, you really need to follow a recipe um, for safety, but also to prevent yourself from making some big mistakes. Because when I first started uh, playing with sumac, I didn't realize how little of it that you needed to use. And so I pretty much wasted a number of batches. So there is one more question now is, do you use fresh herbs? Herbs, herbs, <laughs> apparently I'm Europe, European. Uh, do you use fresh herbs in your, I noticed you said a bay leaf, so you grow your own bay leaf, I imagine. Yes, and now the thing about Fresh, fresh and dried are not interchangeable. You have to rely on the recipe. Um, these recipes um, in, actually encouraged using uh, fresh bay leaves or fresh dill. But when in doubt, always use the dried one. Um, because if it doesn't have a high water content, chances are it hasn't got a lot of bacteria resident in it. Now the um, brine and the vinegar and the water bath canning all will um, tend to uh, reduce the bacteria for sure. And the water bath canning especially will help keep them out. Uh, I'll ask for if there are any more questions right now, but then we'll move on. Um, maybe you can answer this. This is my question. Are you growing like this asparagus here? Was that a grown one? Or are you purchasing them? Like what's your 
you know, you get them from a farmer's market. Maybe you can answer uh, that later. It's up to you. But. Yeah, I don't have quite as much room as I'd like. Okay. And the small, the small uh, two by four uh, size asparagus bed that I was able to fit in took two years to produce and it never made enough to, to pickle. So I will often drive um, east or south and get it, but not in the last couple of years. All, All right. right. Thank you. Carry <clears throat> All right, and everybody wants to have a crisp pickle. Nobody wants really limp ones. And so there's a lot of information and we've got a number of resources in our resource list that you can go to. But I went through all these and pulled out what most of them agreed on are quite honestly ones I think they should have included. So you wanna use the right cucumber, a pickling variety. So really, there are two kinds of cucumbers. And one of them has a lot more water in it and the tissues are not as compact. And those are like your slicing cucumbers or your table cucumber. And then there are these pickling cucumbers. And this didn't come out as well as I'd hoped, but uh, often a lot of pickling cucumbers are the ones that have the little knobs on them, almost like little sharp points sometimes. If you're fortunate enough to have a garden and produce enough cucumbers, to go out and pick them when they're fairly young, fairly small, right out of your garden. Or if you live in an area like we do here, you have the opportunity of something like a Duras a Cucumber Farm where they pick them fresh every morning. Those are gonna be the best. But either way, if there is much of a delay over a couple of hours before you can process them, you wanna store them in ice water. And then also, reason I brought this up is this is the blossom end of the cucumber. Pretty obvious, I've got the stem here, the blossom here. Well, that blossom end contains an enzyme which it will continue to produce even after it's picked and even after you've started pickling it. And that enzyme will make the pickles very limp because it's what encourages the pickles or the cucumbers, if they're just left in nature, to start falling apart and spreading their seeds. And so you want to trim off a sixteenth to a quarter of an inch of that end. And you want to avoid overprocessing. Like I know my mother and grandmother always did quart jars, but those have to stay in the heat longer. And so those will tend to make for a less crisp pickle. And then also only use canning salt with no iodine or additives. And this is just one brand. I'm not endorsing any of these brands. When we do jams and jellies, I endorse Pomona's pectin, but I, I try not to play favorites in any of the other things. Um, and you wanna look for recipes that are raw pack. So the difference between a raw pack and a non raw pack or a cooked pack or a hot pack as they call it, is basically the vegetable or the fruit is brought up to in some liquid to at least boiling point for at least a short time. So there are recipes uh, where you actually boil the vegetable in the vinegar, but that's gonna make for a pretty soft one. And then things like beets have to be cooked blanched somewhat all ahead of time, uh, enough that you can peel them and all that stuff. And so those aren't technically a fresh pack pickle anymore. Um, you wanna add a tannin containing agent, like a grape leaf, a piece of a uh, horseradish leaf, even some black tea. And there's a lot of references and a lot of suggestions for that because the tannin that's contained in all of those is a good organic substitute for alum or lime that used to be used for keeping pickles crisp. Now, there's still you can still buy alum and you can still buy pickling lime, but unless you have just really, really wash it off after you've treated them, it's pretty dangerous. It uh, can cause some bad things to happen in your body. So, like skip these, use tannin 
containing agents. And then this is one I would only recommend, and it is approved, but it's a whole different technique and we don't go into it much. And it's really for only people who have a lot of patience and quite a bit of experience. So instead of heating the jars to 212 degrees, the boiling water bath for just usually it's 10 to 15 minutes max in a regular pickling recipe, you can extend the time at a lower temperature and that will have the same safe effect, but you have to have a very accurate thermometer. You have to have good control over the heat and you have to watch it carefully because you have to hold it at 180 to 185 degrees for a minimum of 30 minutes, depending on the recipe. So there are, you can do searches for this. It is called the low temperature pasteurization pickle method. And um, if you wanna try it sometime, try all the other methods first and make sure you've got enough patience for that. Then this is the short brine technique I've talked about. It's a way of preparing usually mixed chopped vegetables so that it draws a lot of the uh, natural water out of it. And then when you take them and drain them and you uh, introduce the brine that has the pickles and has absorbed spice flavors, that's drawn through osmosis back into the vegetable. And so a lot of these um, use it. And there's a far lower concentration of salt uh, than you would have in a fermented group. And you keep it at a cooler temperature much longer. And so the weak and cool temperatures don't allow fermentation to start because you only keep it in there for two to 12 hours. And so a lot of examples for that, these are just some uh, that I've made at different times. I admit I didn't make this one, but I like that color. But uh, carrot and radish, just shred it up. Um, chow chow, which is usually a lot of green tomatoes uh, and then other spices. A lot of mustard seed in that one. Uh, into the garden relish, which has just about everything in it. This is often the kind of thing I remember my grandmother and mother making where they had one of those old metal uh, meat and vegetable grinders that they put together and they screwed it on attached to the table. And from, you know, hours every day, they would just, somebody had to turn that crank and it was often me grinding up these vegetables to go in. Oh, and I was gonna say, there are, if you're using the, the uh, specific recipe, there are some other ingredients that aren't usually put in pickles, uh, but this like a pickle lily uh, will often have something in it that thickens this up like cornstarch or, uh, or even, uh, I think some recipe, well, I saw one recipe once that used flour, but usually it's a much more liquid. And then there's fermented which is known also as long brining. And it starts with vegetables or fruits and a lot of pickling spices and salt. And recipes specifies the right amount of salt because what it does is that that inhab inhibits the bad bacteria. So it's uh, it, the salt solution is 2% to up to 5%, depending on the kind of vegetables. So you wanna use a very specific recipe for that. And that allows the lactic acid producing bacteria to grow. And those are the kind of things that make like yogurt and different variations of those go into different cheeses, but also it's what, uh, converts vegetables and when they ferment, it actually changes the chemistry more than when you do the other forms of pickling. And it actually makes the texture a lot different. And a good fermented pickle is probably never going to be crisp, but it's worth it, worth it a lot of times. 
Yes. Um, we have a question about kimchi. and Maybe this isn't something you know about. Is it a form of pickling or fermentation? Well, fermentation, uh, pickling, fermentation is a method of pickling. I just, see. just to clarify, but it is a, definitely a long brine at fermentation. Kimchi is, yeah. And then uh, someone was curious if you have ever tried lemon cucumbers and are they good for pickling? I did not have good success with those, but then I picked my lemon cucumbers too late and they were too big and too tough, but they hmm. tended to just go mushy. But I, I really believe that was my fault. I think you probably could. I think it, if you made it work, it would add a wonderful color to whatever you were making. Interesting. Um, someone also wants to know, is there a difference if you use if you use tap water versus distilled water? Uh, a lot of folks recommend the distilled water simply because there might be the additional, um, you know, minerals in it. You might have a, especially if you're using well water, you might have iron. Um, I would never use water that is chlorinated. I think that would not be good at all. Um, I don't know that anybody has ever published anything I've seen about fluoride in the water. But yeah, if you're doing small, I, I looked at the um, a statistic, the chemical breakdown on the Tacoma uh, tap water, and I just use it. Okay. I've had several. Depends where you live. If you got a well in your backyard and you're doing that, then maybe think about using something a little. Yeah, one, one of the clues for sure, somebody told me, is if you live somewhere where you're using well water or even in a city and you have a lot of hard water uh, flakes or accumulation, especially like in your teapot, if you have one where you boil stuff in it, uh, then you probably are going to want to use a distilled water or something like that, because obviously then you've got minerals and you don't know what they are. Good advice, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then um, after you've prepared the vegetables, whatever you're using, you place them in a container for the fermentation. And that can take um, one to six weeks, depending on what you're fermenting and also the taste that you want out of it. Because almost always the longer it sits, the more sour it'll be because of the more lactic acid produced. But at a certain point then, it really breaks the vegetables down and it's not, not as good. So I have not really liked to teach fermentation in the past because um, it's just really hard and it takes a lot of time and you know, they can't just sit around in whatever commercial kitchen we're using. So people have to take it home and there's no control over it. But as we get into more discussion here, I think I'm going to start um, introducing some classes in this because I found a way that I can help people maintain some control uh, as it's fermenting at home, but we'll get to that. Um, I think this might be a good place because I've been talking really fast. So uh, this might be a good place uh, to go ahead and mention that we are going to be starting to have uh, on-hand classes beginning as early as August 7th and 10th out at Trinity Lutheran Church. And we're going to, within the next um, 48 hours, we'll be posting that on our Facebook page and uh, sending out some information about that. And those particular classes are just small uh, enrollment. It's just going to be seven people in each one. We're going to be making uh, what's called a recipe called the favorite garlic dill pickle. So you'd get to practice this and it's cost free. There's no charge for that one. So I'm sorry, Gator, did you have something else you wanted to say? No, I'm good. I was just going to, I thought you were thinking about doing a poll, but we're good. Um, you have a poll? Did, uh, we have one, but we can wait. Um, there is a question about thermometers. Maybe you're going to get to equipment at some point. So I think we can hold off on that. So just 
back of your brain, think about thermometers and we'll get Okay, to that. yeah, yeah. Um, actually, only with the low temperature do you really need a thermometer, but. Oh, okay, excellent. So this is the traditional container that we have. Uh, probably if you remember your grandmother or even looking, finding one in an antique store. And they're just basically called open crocks. And they're usually some kind of ceramic. Uh, certainly they are ones that have been glazed, so they're sealed. Often they have some really nice decorations on them. They did some elaborate before they glazed, put the final glaze. And basically they're just an open container. And what happens is like, we're going to be using sauerkraut uh, as the example during this uh, part of the presentation. So you would shred that very fine in the case of sauerkraut and you treat it with salt mixture and you put it in here and you pack it down in and you put, you want to then seal the outside air out. And with the open crock, the way that they had done it, is to take some of the cabbage leaves that haven't been shredded and put them on top. And then you put some kind of a weight to hold all the cabbage down so it doesn't float. Because if the salt hasn't released, hasn't drawn enough liquid out of the cabbage that it's totally uh, submerged in its own juice, you add a brine solution. And it should cover at the weight, it should cover all of that. So they have the open crock. And then you have some of these, oh, that picture got reversed. Anyway, it says uh, Harvest Fiesta. <laughs> and these are very special uh, water seal crocks. And I'm going to, I realized just yesterday, but didn't have a chance to take another photo. What it is, is basically it's this crock and it's got this lid. And what happens is they have these weights that after you get all the sour, all the uh, shredded cabbage and the salt and the water and the brine in, these, there's a pair of them and it sits really nicely on top of the whole thing and holds it, holds them down. But then you put the lid back on and this is like a um, trough and you fill it with water almost up to the top. And that creates a really nice seal and it keeps it sealed. And then the fermentation process creates carbon dioxide, which is allowed to escape. And you can see bubbles around the edge. And I've made uh, some sauerkraut in this and they work really well. They're really slick, but they're also very expensive. And honestly, this was a gift from someone. I probably wouldn't have uh, purchased it. But recently with the advent of so much interest in what's called small batch canning and trying to use up just odds and ends and things like that, they've been working more with adapting like the wine making and other equipment to allow people to make much smaller batches like a single quart. Um, like for example, this holds uh, almost three quarts. Uh, and some of the crocs can go up to five quarts. I mean, five gallons, I'm sorry. Um, but you can make like a quart or even a pint. And so this is, I'm, make, I'm making some sauerkraut. This is uh, the sauerkraut them shredded up. Uh, you can, they, they have special uh, sauerkraut or cabbage shredders you can get. You can also use uh, attachment of a mandolin, or if you're just doing these small batches, like the one quart worth, you can just use a knife and shred it up very fine. And then you're going to uh, want to add a salt to it to start drawing out the liquid. And so this is a still photo taken out of uh, one of our videos that are posted. And so basically you reserve one cab, uh, cabbage leaf, you shred the cabbage, place it in a bowl, sprinkle with salt, 
toss it well and let's let it sit for some time and then you massage it but you can also use this what's called a tamper and rather than just squeezing and squeezing it because five minutes actually i'm trained as a massage therapist and five minutes of squeezing cabbage is actually a lot of work um, but you firmly pack it after you've massaged it into the jar or whatever you're um, using and you pour the liquid from the cabbage onto it and put the leaf that you reserved on top, place a weight on it, add something to keep air out, but allow carbon dioxide to, ex to escape. And you ferment it at room temperature until it's as soured to the taste you like. And this, you want the probiotics, you want those uh, lactose, lactic acid uh, producing bacteria. So water bath canning, you can do that and you can store it for a long time that way, but you're going to kill all those bacteria that you actually want. So to have it bioactive, you want to store it in the fridge. And so this is what recipes look like on our recipe page. We have a whole page devoted to pickles and different kinds. And so if you want to try this mason jar sauerkraut, go here because there's a lot of details that couldn't fit on that slide, like the weight of the cabbage, the amount of salt, uh, things like that. So going back here, so weights, different kinds of weights, working specifically with uh, jars, they make some really nice glass weights. So you have your um, leaf and you have the liquid over it and you put one of these glass weights on. If you're using like the crock that I showed in the beginning is about a one gallon, this saucer fits perfectly and you can see through it. And then I just use a bag uh, filled with water, but it shouldn't be just plain water. It needs to be like a, a, a brine recipe, like the one uh, that tell that we were uh, <clears throat> like two to 5%, depending on the recipe. So that if the bag opens, it's not going to dilute the salt uh, in the brine. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, we have a recipe question, and I had the same one, so great. On the sauerkraut, you mentioned using salt to sprinkle the salt. Uh, the question is, is that pickling salt for sauerkraut, or is that just regular pickling salt? salt? No, pickling okay. salt. Uh, all of these recipes, pickling salt, including if you're making like a, a gelled, uh, like a conserve or something like that. Um, pickling salt is not much more expensive. And you can also get kosher salt. Kosher salt also doesn't have any iodine in it. Okay. But it may have traces of minerals. So um, I noticed I, I did post the link to that page, uh, the recipe page for sauerkraut. And I did bring it up on my computer. And it does say uh, three and three quarter teaspoons to five teaspoons of salt. So everyone just understand that pickling salt is what we're talking here, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, as, as kind of obvious when we're doing these videos, this just gives you an overview. Uh, on our videos, like usually it'll list all the ingredients and then it'll list this the bare minimum of what the uh, process is. And so you have the weights and then you need to get into keeping oxygen out and letting carbon dioxide or out and keeping oxygen from coming in. So if you're using a small jar, one of the ways to do it as both a weight and helping with the airlock business would be to fill another jar that fits like inside a pint and let that push down. And there's enough liquid that the, uh, it's sort of like the um, water sealed crock is that it bubbles up through the water. And then there are these airlocks that you can, you know, spend a lot of money on Amazon and buy the whole assembly, 
or you can just look around and get some of these plastic lids and they make grommets and then you can buy these. This stuff and the grommets you can get at pretty much any place that sells winemaking equipment. And then some of the others, and this doesn't often work really well. This is this one. You can't see all of it. I just, I'm not used to using these green screen things, but it basically it's soft and it's rubber and it has just like a little pin prick in up here that allows the carbon dioxide to escape coming up from the bottom, but it doesn't allow the oxygen to come in. And then this is a better view of this lid. And what you've got is you actually have, there we go, actually have ways of setting this so that it has months and it has all 31 days. So you know when you started it. And uh, those, this uh, by the way is uh, called a pickle pipe. And this is a fermentation lid. And then these are just various airlocks. And then this is a batch that has been fermenting for a while. You can't really see the glass weight in there, but it's in there. And then you can see a corner of the leaf turned up and you can see how it's turned kind of milky. Now it's going to, if it's fermenting properly, it is going to turn sort of milky uh, on the top there. And it's going to be bubbling, fermenting, like if you've ever made wine or anything like that, you're gonna see the ferment. But if you start to see mold, the whole batch is gone. You should just toss the whole thing, not worry about it. And then this is some that was made earlier and that's what the product looks like. And then here is just some example of some of the different things you can ferment and some recipes uh, that are there, like the traditional Indian lime pickles, which I love. And they're very, um, usually quite hot. You can, there are many, especially middle European recipes for pickling beets in different ways with all different kinds of spices. And cranberries, you can make a fermented cranberry relish as opposed to just a cranberry relish. And then some of the other things like um, the Moroccan spiced carrots. Moroccans ferment a lot of different things, including uh, carrots. And then the uh, curried mango ginger chutney that I haven't had a chance to try, but it looks wonderful. And then this is ways that you can contact us. This is our website. And on our website, we have a lot of different pages. Uh, you can see all of those different ones. And we're going to be changing, we're using Blogger right now, and we're going to be changing into a regular website page so that it'd be a little easier. But right now, the recipes are subdivided into their own separate pages, like the pickling page, which we had gone to earlier, and a lot of others. Excellent. And I did put that tiny URL in the in the uh, chat and we've added other uh, these links for everybody. And then we have a Facebook page, as I mentioned, that has a lot of up-to-date information. And I try every week, a lot of people send me some very clever cartoons and photos and memes. So every Friday, just for the heck of it, I post a Friday funny. And the YouTube channel we looked at and this is our uh, email site, and this is uh, the phone number. And like I said, the Facebook page is the first page, place that we post information about uh, new workshops and hands-on events and things like what we're doing here today. Uh, we also 
um, are always looking for donations for the Preserving for the Hungry program, which is the one that I mentioned where we work with food banks and feeding ministries, sometimes even with their own clients to make jams and jellies and applesauce out of surplus fruits. And it, we are licensed by the Department of Agriculture. We have a food processing license for each of the two sites we use. And we're also always looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in finding out about different ways you can help with supplies or funds or volunteers, you know, please contact us, either email me directly, take or call or take a look at Facebook page and message me there. And then just one, uh, want to go ahead and bring up this tiny URL. So you'll see once again, we have all this information. And I would refer you to the Natalie and Tara Try Stuff if you want to see some amusing, um, <laughs> see some amusing experiments where um, two pretty creative young ladies uh, go ahead and try different things. And they have a whole playlist on Pickle Month. And the last thing I always try to leave with some important final thoughts. And what's more important than a good joke and a pun? And so now I'd welcome any kind of questions that folks have. It doesn't have to be about pickling. Fantastic. I'm going to uh, stop sharing that. Thank you, Hal. Thank you. Um, there is a question about equipment, uh, best equipment for a hot bath. Now I imagine this is for the, the, the process, the canning process. Uh, water bath canners. Um, just go on to Amazon. You don't have to buy it there, but just go there, uh, you know, look for water bath canners and it will show you um, different brands are about the same. They're enameled. They're like the traditional thing. Uh, the only thing that's with a lot of difference is, <clears throat> you know, it, it usually is cost and they're usually about 21 quart of water size. And that's, that's a fairly big one, but they also make some 11 and 14, but a canner, a water bath or any kind has some kind of a rack on the bottom that lifts the jars off the bottom and away from the direct heat and allows the hot water to circulate all the way around it. So people have used big like stew pots or, you know, stock pots, I mean, with a rack in it and it's been successful, but usually those don't seal and keep the heat in as well as a regular water bath canner. Um, probably I should add to this presentation a, uh, picture or two of, of the stuff in a water bath canner because as fast as I talk we still have some time left which is good <laughs> <laughs> there's always, you know, always room for more um, so I think that's something you can just search for water bath canners um, and then um, don't forget I'm going to remind everybody now this is a recorded video and if you felt how talk too fast I, I don't think I think you were just right on but um, if you needed anything to rewatch part of it or go back and see what he was talking about or look at the, the still image. You can always look at the video and it'll be available. You can search the city um, YouTube channel, City of Tacoma um, YouTube channel and look for the playlist for the Enviro House workshop and how-to videos. And then this video specifically will be posted to the Enviro House webpage, which is cityoftacoma.org forward slash workshops, probably within a week, depending how long it takes them to upload it. Um, and this information, uh, I don't know if your slide deck's going to be available for anyone to download, but definitely the resource list that we've put up there will be a great place for all these resources too. So I've been kind of browsing as you're talking some of these pages you've given us, and there's so much out there, and you've you've really given us a nice like focus on some very um, concise stuff. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, just one uh, quick thing about our. YouTube channel. We are up to about 32 uh, videos on there. And it will also, as time goes on, be a lot more. Um, 
you can really tell when the pandemic started and we started recording videos in the empty senior center and when we were far into it, how basically I started like degenerating with a, you know, haircut and all of that. But also the technique has gotten a lot better and I will redo some of the earlier ones someday. But I want to do just a really quick shout out to everybody who's helped us produce these workshops and videos, but also a shout out to Kate Gray from the Point Defiance Ruston Senior Center, who has taught herself how to produce videos, do some fairly, um, you know, some fairly advanced editing and cinematography. And uh, so we've been working together ever since April of the, the dark year. Uh, <laughs> well, that's great. Um, uh, someone did want to comment uh, that this was an excellent presentation. Uh, my sentiments exactly also. Um, and, you know, we were producing videos, we are producing videos for the Enviro Challenger program. And the first few ones are really, you know, I'm a, I've been a professional, you know, video produ producer for years, but getting back into it after all those years, like to make those videos, it is fun to see the first one versus <laughs> the last one. <laughs> and you see the, the advancements of my own skills and like, I don't know about your editor, but I like to throw in a new trick every episode to try something new. So I'm always advancing my skills, but yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes she surprises me. <laughs> right, it's fun. I think it's fun when other people do that stuff too. So good job, good on you. Um, uh, again, the resource list that's available, I put in the, in the links uh, on the chat. So make sure you get that before we end this webinar. Um, we do have one more poll question. Jan, I'm gonna put the poll question off uh, if you wanna add anything right now. I do. I will, while they're doing the poll, um, I added most of what Hal had on his resource list, except for some of the very specific ones. Um, if they do not show up, we're trying to figure out how to get those recorded. So when you watch the video, they are in like a sidebar. <clears throat> if those are not showing up as, in the sidebar in the video, um, I will email this list to everybody that is on watching um, the video today. Um, we had almost 100 people that actually registered. Not everybody showed up, but um, I won't be able to email it out to 100 people, but I will email it to um, those of you that are um, registered. Probably without much of a message. I'll just say, here's the list and send it off. Sometimes that's all you need. Um, so I'm going to give everyone a few more moments to answer the poll, um, and then I'll share the results. So uh, if you could answer the question here before we move forward, what other food processing skills are you interested in learning more about? This will give us an idea of maybe other uh, topics we can host here, but just kind of in general, give you about three more seconds, two and one. Let's take a look. Looks like, uh, ooh, jams and jellies are really on that high list. You know, it's blackberry season at my house. And I don't know, my favorite thing in the world is blackberry jam with the seeds. I think I'm, I'm oh. unique in that. No, but you're not. You're not. I, every time you buy it, it's all seedless. And I'm like, oh, I like that little bit in my teeth. Like, oh. so, anyway. <laughs> you can come pick off my back hillside anytime. There we go. Can I do a little bit of uh, promotion for probably upcoming next month? Uh, we're going to do... Uh, uh, hands-on uh, blackberry rhubarb lime jam oh. and the reason I like to do that is because not only is it a, a really nice jam I mean I could just give you the recipe but we also discuss about kind of looking ahead and planning like all of those things as, well lime doesn't come here anyway naturally but so many times different things come at different times and so like with this recipe, we'll discuss about how you can use frozen or even dehydrated blackberries, the same thing with rhubarb. And you can do just some really simple planning ahead. I'm, I'm really into preserving and having on hand base ingredients, even more than just product, so that you can use different techniques. So that would probably be another PowerPoint. But and then one of the things we need to talk about, Gator, is how realistic it is to share short videos within the process of a PowerPoint. But yeah, that's we in the work. weeds. Yeah, we're right, right. 
<laughs> well, and I think, you know, when it comes to the whole canning process, you know, not just pickling, but, you know, we used to, as humans, preserve things when we were growing them or when they were harvested so that we could have them when they weren't available, right? I mean, that's the basics of it all. And so when you talk about this, having bases on hand, you know, you can your blackberries after the summer so you can have them in the middle of winter and spring, right? So, so these are all great, you know, ideas and to, to have recipes around that, you know, you can something or freeze it now so that when that next thing's available, you can mix it with that and make something. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah so just one, one last little plug. If on our uh, blog page slash website, we're developing uh, libraries of things. One of them that you could look at is called Stocking the Pantry. Mm -hmm. And it was a whole series we did about um, fruits and vegetables, things to preserve and stuff that you can do with those things over the course of a season. So it's gonna, that's really, these libraries are gonna be growing into playlists and things like that but we just putting together a lot of information that hopefully help people in different ways hit the ground running. I'm not a brilliant writer and the videos aren't brilliant, but it's basic information. <laughs> hey, you know, you, this presentation was such that it was, you know, I think, I think it'll be just great. <laughs> so um, one last question here, uh, where should you store canned products indoor in the garage? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Once you make them shelf stable, where do you recommend we uh, hide these from our family? I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, put them somewhere so that they're ready when we need them. Well, the 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 basic ground rule is out of direct sunlight. In fact, out of any strong light. Uh, so usually in a cabinet is good. And you want to keep the temperature range. You know, if it is consistently or even for long periods of time. Uh, if the ambient temperature that they're in is over 75 degrees, it's going to shorten the life of the nutrients. You also never want them to freeze because even though you leave headroom to create a vacuum, that usually isn't like the amount of room you have to leave if you're using canning jars for freezing. Which, by the way, side note, not all canning jars were built to have stuff frozen in them. So when you're buying new jars, look and see if it says they're freezer uh, stable. God. All right. So I'm, I'm much like a pickled jar. Keep in a dark area below 75 degrees. Thank you. Good to know. Um, fantastic. Uh, I think we're good. We're going to wrap it up here. I think everyone's very grateful and wonderful presentation. Um, we look forward to more of these uh, from you and going to your, checking out your website and looking at these library, you know, items and seeing how we can, you know, it's amazing how the pandemic has kind of reminded us how we used to do it. Like my, my dad talked about a place in his hometown that had a, a community canning facility. Yes. People could bring their yeah. harvest to it, use the equipment there, and then take their jars home. And that's something we need, like we need to reestablish these things because, you know, there, there are like, we have a tool library here that might have those uh, available products. So you don't have to buy all that. Um, ask your friends to share, look on websites to, you know, sharing websites. So it's, it's a, it's, it's inter interesting how we've all been reminded of how things used to be. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I'm looking forward to the possibility of working with the tool library. Um, they're settling, still settling into their new space there in the, and the public library but oh, right, uh, right. we're hopefully they're going to get quite a stock of, of stuff yeah that'll be great we, we did a workshop with them um this summer or the spring and um that is a recorded one also and we're planning to do um more workshops with them on specific tools or processes or ways that they can um, use the facilities that they have so Keep in tune for that. Excellent. And um, really appreciate Hal's time. He always puts so much time in on these uh, presentations and I know they are very much appreciated. So we will be hoping to see you again in this fall, Hal, and doing another one on maybe something off our list like jams or jellies or whatever. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's always appropriate. 
and we'll see it probably will not be in person uh yet but yeah yeah i'm hmm. thinking that too so okay unless there are any other questions i think um that'll do it a wrap thank yep. you everybody okay. take care thanks, Gator. thanks hal